You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Tamlin Dipper, the British author responsible for In the Tomb of the White Baron, returns this year with another fabulous mythos tale, Porcelain Blood. The story tells of a British Shanghai municipal police constable who finds himself drawn into a strange investigation involving a room with no doors, a theft with no object, and a criminal who has committed no legislated crime. And without further ado, this is Porcelain Blood. We hope you enjoy it, folks. Porcelain Blood by Tamlin Dipper Top Secret, Sovereign Only 1-Q413A, March 21st, 1961 Archivist Note The following account is a transcript from the personal papers of Inspector Mark Barraclough that describe events in the year 1928 when the author was a constable in the Shanghai Municipal Police. The notes appear to have been composed for an autobiography that was never submitted for publication. The notes were delivered to the CIA Special Archives, along with the other papers from the SMP Special Branch, secured by Operation Wristwatch in 1952. Baraclough went missing from official records in 1942, See Operation Silent Strata for further information on disappearances of British and Imperial staff in the Pacific Theatre during this period. See also Zong Chang, Zhang, Corant, Jasper, Chesterton, Gilbert Keith, Greengrass, Witchwood. Transcript follows. Chapter 1 you can tell a lot about a man by how he eats. Inspector Treadfan ate with mechanical intensity, placing each morsel from his bowl into his mouth with quick, neat movements. All the while his eyes moved swiftly from point to point, like a searchlight, not darting but placed quickly and mechanically, like the morsels of food. He did not speak when eating, except to acknowledge the proprietor. Treadfan ate noodles. He ate dim sum. He ate peking duck and steamed vegetables. And because I was his assigned detective constable, I ate the same. Or at least I tried to on duty. My loyal observance had already marked me out as an oddball at the station, just like my inspector. Not entirely to be trusted. A lump of something blood-red winked at me from the hot water. I prodded it, and it slid away with the same disobedience that made the noodles flick oil over my tunics. I rearranged the handkerchief I carried with me, and brandished my chopsticks again. It was no good. That blood red was making my guts jostle about, like the pedestrians shoving past on the pavement mere feet away. At least Inspector Treadfan made no show of noticing my distress as he settled up. I managed a couple of vegetables, then shoved mine away, as if I was full, even though I had barely eaten. Returning to the pavement, and into the cold, bright light, we looked around, and saw that the municipal workers were just finishing up. A man's body, broken as a pig's knuckle, was being stuffed into a small wheeled cart for transportation. His dead face gazed at me blindly. They had not covered him. Treadfan gently placed a hand on a municipal worker, and made some inquiry in dialect. I was still learning the basics of the half-dozen types of Chinese spoken here. He made some marks on his notebook, and slipped the paper into the dead man's vest. We had already identified his street name as Du Yan Yu, based on a passing acquaintance. He had no family, his own being lost somewhere on the road to Shanghai from his mountain village. Despite being a familiar face and roused about, no one had stepped forward to claim him. I did not know what would become of the remains. In my notebook, I had made record of the circumstances of his death. Apparently, some fruit had fallen from a handcart, 
and in a rush to prevent it being trampled in the road, he had bent to retrieve it. He was run down in its place. We had arrived on the scene on foot, hearing a hue and cry, but been unable to identify the owner of the vehicle that had sent him tumbling headfirst into the ground. He had been dazed and faded quickly, as the inspector knelt over him. It was not the first dead body I had seen, but it was the first death I had seen, and in spite of our distinctions of race and class, I was not unmoved. The vendor that Dewar died helping was nowhere to be seen. Having taken our notes, we continued our patrol. In the weeks since my arrival, I had grown accustomed to this postprandial habit of the inspector. He believed firmly in walking the streets, while I marched studiously along in his wake, feeling as ornamental and ineffective as a balloon tied to an adventurous child. We took a turn off Boundary Road, then another, soon detaching me from my bearings. I knew to listen for the telltale whistle of the trains. The train line was outside our jurisdiction. The dark alleys were shadowed enough that my surge winter uniform, which had been so stifling on arrival, was beginning to feel rather more sensible. I concentrated on my official composure, back straight, as we rounded another corner, heading back towards the river and into the concession. Inspector Tradfan stopped and hailed a passing Chinese businessman. They exchanged a few words, and Tradfan took a light for a cigarette. I decided against. It is impossible to look aloof while puffing like a steam engine on a murad. I rocked from my toes to my heels, and scanned the street ahead. Nothing much happening on this side show. An ice cart, and a couple of tufts with old-fashioned shaved Q haircuts and baggy clothing. Beyond them, North Gyangsi Road. We would take a right turn down there, and do a turn around the market. Inspector Treadfan passing the time of day with all and sundry, from shoe shiners to fortune tellers, then back to the station to check on the wire, and me to type up reports as dictated. Constable, allow me to introduce you to Mr. Arthur Cho. Mr. Cho owns a number of important garment works along Seward Road. I was just saying that you probably pass his property on your way home. I began to extend my hand, but unsure of the etiquette in greeting a Chinese, I settled for touching the brim of my uniform cap. Good afternoon, sir, I said solemnly, then ventured, Wu An, Zhao Shang Hao. From the frozen expressions of both the Chinese and the inspector, I had stumbled badly, despite daily practice with the phrase book. A blush rose from beneath my collar. I could feel it in my ears. Fortunately, I was saved by a scream. It rose from around a corner, accompanied by the sound of broken glass. Treadfan was already moving, even as I rotated to find the source. Not the ice cart man, who was stock still in mid-stride, goggling about like me. The young toughs had braced up and glared as we began making our way up the road in their direction. The inspector had his head cocked on one side, listening for more sounds, when a third tough in similar dress came barreling out of a tiny alley. He ran past what I assumed were his co-conspirators. Then all three were running towards the main road. We gave chase, feeling at a disadvantage to their agile, slippered movements in our hobnails, although we had a foot of added stride in our favour. Two broke left on the main street, and one right. The inspector going after the two, he shouted for me to stay on the spear, and disappeared before I made the corner. My own quarry had stayed put, trying to blend in, but quickly realized I had his scent and ran off again. I considered using my whistle, but couldn't imagine getting it between my lips at the gallop, so held pace. On we ran, his cue flapping like the tail of a fox down Kiangsi and across the familiar bustle of Haining Road, pedestrians wearily stepping aside from both of us, going about their day. Neither Chinese nor Europeans were shocked by a hot pursuit. Continuing south, my man began ducking and weaving, to feint towards side alleys and using cover, but I wasn't fooled. He was bearing south, and meant to reach some destination there. I had his heels and would not give in, 
This was my first chance to be more than ornamental, and four years of rugby league had given me the legs and the build for the chase. A blousy matron and housekeeper were the only ones to protest rather than make way, and I swerved around them with the ease of a winger. On and on we ran. Two other officers outside the hospital just grinned mockingly at my pursuit, and stayed talking to the nurses. On the iron bridge across the creek was our first halt for breath. He slowed, and leaned over the parapet for a moment, as I began approaching more deliberately. He pulled himself upright, back onto the bridge, and looked at me with weary contempt. "'Come on now,' I said in my best commanding tone in English. I held my hands up. "'You come with me, and we'll sort this all out. No need to jump.' A couple of European men on the far side of the road showed a more than idle interest, and looked as if they might cross to render assistance. A couple of brewery drays impeded them. In reply, the tough yelled some sort of Chinese curse, stamped one foot, and made off. I had not realized before, but he was holding something swaddled in cloth. Had he been carrying it the whole time, or retrieved it from the bridge parapet? It was about the size of a loaf of bread. No matter, that was for later. We pounded on, and down the bund. Great imposing buildings to our right, steamships of various kinds to our left at manifold keys and jetties. I spotted the distinctive headgear of a French gendarme ahead, and began hallooing, at which the laconic figure aroused itself and began making his way over. This caused my man to dash nimbly down a gangplank, and on board a singularly dishevelled tramp steamer. He disappeared inside. Now he was cornered. I took a moment to greet my French counterpart, although I was quickly disabused of his cooperation by a string of invective. To this I tried to react with dignity, only slightly marred by skew-whiff hat and tangled truncheon. Behind me I caught sight of the two civilians from earlier on the bridge who were approaching at a brisk walk. A food vendor regarded us with judicious indifference, even though we were blocking their customers from approaching their cart. No doubt there would have been an immediate diplomatic impasse, between Lady Liberty and Britannia, had the fugitive and his companions not opened a brisk fire from the steamer. This forced us to find cover behind various inadequate items. I chose a lamp post, which on reflection was like trying to hide my hand behind a pencil. All four of us drew pistols, the civilians blazing away with gusto, while the French official and I tried to mark a target on the rusting hulk. The return fire was inaccurate but potent. At least three or more shooters. Distinctly unpleasant. Locals scattered in all directions. But glancing about, there was no more assistance to be had. The taller European ran crabwise across the road, firing as he went, and ducked in behind a pile of cargo. Not liking my current position, I went to join him, and from there we fired the occasional shot. He seemed perfectly content, but for my part my hand was shaking, and I wondered how long a fight could go on in the principal thoroughfare of the concession, before reinforcements arrived. The gendarme and I made helpful and unintelligible suggestions to each other. Two or three minutes passed before I smelt something odd—sulphur, copper, charcoal— a greenish smoke or vapour was coming off the boat when I looked, although I might have had my curiosity rewarded rather brutally if it were not for my ally squeezing off two rounds which took my sniper in the throat. My head buzzed for a moment or two as I realised how close a call I had had. Then I thought stupidly that they must be raising steam to depart. If they steamed off, we would have no means to pursue them and they might make clean away. This realization put some steel back in me. I meant to have an arrest after all, and to see what was in that bundle. To that end, I rejoined the fight, noticing that the stockier spectacled civilian had grabbed the enormous iron wok from the food vendor, and was making his way across the road behind it like a turtle. To our advantage, he was drawing fire, and round spanked off the metal bowl. This let us work to better effect. 
You may wonder at such groups firing over a distance of only a dozen or so yards. All I can say is that neither side had much luck with our pistols, since we're all in cover of one kind or another. We might have gone on quite some time, if matters had not developed rather suddenly. With a startled cry from the distant onlookers, a gout of green flame belched out of a hatch on the boat. Cries and screams could be heard from below. I began running up the gangplank when a figure wreathed in flame burst forth. It was a man. I could see the remains of his hair cue blazing as he lurched towards me, his face blistering and melting in the awful heat of whatever device had set him ablaze. A sword, blackening in the fire, was held limply in one hand. I don't mind admitting the sight and smell will never leave me. I put one shot, then two, then three into him, and before he could draw near, his wounds brought him low. He pitched head first over the railing and into the water of the river, but even though he was no longer in my path, I hesitated to go further. Pale green fire licked across the deck, flaking the paintwork. The iron hull itself seemed to be burning even in the seconds we were standing there, and the upper works and funnel were turning into weirdly glowing cinders in the growing inferno. Shouts for the fire brigade quickly proved pointless as we stood on the quayside and watched in horror. More figures emerged screaming and plunged into the river, not to rise again. A side of the ship came free and splashed down, still burning. A great steam cloud brewed up, choking the area and stinging our eyes. The stocky civilian licked his lips and pursed them in judicious assessment. Pale green light flickered in his glasses. Well, if that doesn't beat all, he said. I had to agree with him. In comparison with the scene at the docks, the police station that afternoon was a sober, steady scene, at least until I ran into my sergeant. Without a right to reply, I believe he has since died on duty. I shall name him Sergeant Smeck, although I suspect any other constable from that era will know precisely to whom I refer. Constable Barraclough, he barked. Come here and explain the state of you. I turned, marched across, and came to attention eyes forward. "'Well?' he bawled, breath boozy in my ear, his face like an open beef sandwich. "'Shoot out down the dock, sergeant. That's no excuse to have you trailing in here with soot on your face and your tunic pulled in three directions. You look like a Frenchman's bed.' This would have continued further had there not been the click of a door and the mild voice of Inspector Treadfan interrupting. "'Sergeant, May we have the constable for a moment? And just like that, my lashing was deferred. I tugged my tunic straight as best I could, marched into the inspector's office, and saluted smartly. I was slightly unsure who to salute, though, because Superintendent Anderson and another man in expensive civilian dress were also there. So I saluted everyone individually, and got a dismissive wave for my trouble. "'I've just been speaking with the French commissionaire,' said the superintendent, with a pained expression. Apparently one of my officers just blew up a ship on the bund. "'No, sir. Yes, well, I don't suppose you'd admit it if you had. So, what did happen? Sir, I, I was pursuing a fleeing suspect, as ordered, and he boarded a steam vessel. I had signalled a French police officer.' and he was taking charge of the situation when the suspect and his associates opened fire upon us. Shortly after opening fire, some sort of device went off and burned the ship. I see. Why was the fire brigade not summoned? I glanced at Treadfan, but he was looking into empty space as if distracted. I do not know, sir. The fire burned very fiercely. It must have burned away to the water line in five to ten minutes. The superintendent looked at me sceptically over his glasses, but the unknown civilian leaned forward, and after carefully balancing a cigar in the ashtray, he drew my attention, and asked, "'Please go on. Tell us more about the fire.' "'Green fire. Pale fire, sir. It burned everything, even the metal. 
and it burned the men. They tried to jump ship, but the memory arrested me momentarily. They burned away, too. The superintendent and the other man exchanged looks. It was strange, because the civilian-clothed man met his gaze as an equal, despite being at least two decades younger, barely older than myself, a toff, certainly. Political, maybe? And these two, um, civilians? He gestured with distaste at the reports on the desk. Special constables out of uniform, sir, I responded. I took their numbers and checked their papers, just passing by and pitched in. Happenstance. The superintendent hemmed at this and nudged at some paper, as if special constables were a personal curse from the gods sent to vex him. Well, given the, um, circumstances, I think we had better put the matter in the hands of the special branch. Sergeant Courant? the superintendent queried, and the well-dressed young man silently inclined his head. "'Did you see anyone swim away?' came the quiet inquiry from behind me. "'Tredfan?' asked Courant, with a slight warning tone. I was surprised, given the sergeant was an inferior rank. "'You said they all burned, but are you sure you didn't see anyone swim away?' Tredfan continued. There was an awkward silence— and Courant retrieved his cigar. He blew smoke like a disturbed squid. It only partly obscured his irritation. The superintendent made no secret and scowled at Tredfan. "'I only thought, sir,' Tredfan addressed the superintendent, "'that with these, ah, uh, revolutionaries, their leaders tend to have a more acute regard for their survival. I could see them immolating a hideout.' but not a commander taking himself with it. "'Couldn't say, sir,' I ventured. "'I was on the dock, but under fire. Someone might have jumped into the river. With all the commotion, we might not have heard them.' "'Yes, well, the decision is made. Hand over your notes to Sergeant Courant here, and Special Branch will take over. You can return to duties. You, ah, uh, Constable, could apparently use a little range time, eh?' I bristled at this but snapped my eyes front, saluted, and turned on my heel. I was followed at a leisurely pace by my inspector. We returned to our desks, and I cranked the reluctant spider that was my typewriter into place. I checked the ribbon and wedged my pocketbook firmly before commencing my report. Tradfan merely tore some pages out of his own book and secured them under my hat on the desk. So fierce was the contest of wills between man and machine— that I almost didn't notice Sergeant Courant departing. He did not acknowledge us, but both Tradfan and I watched him go. Tradfan waved out a match and wrinkled his moustache. Over an hour with the superintendent, on a trifling matter of gangs, mused Tradfan, when the French have already taken responsibility, he said to the ceiling. I waited patiently, but when he declined to elaborate— I went on punching the keys. Chapter 2 That night was a toil, as I had to launder my own uniform in my little lodgings, sponge and soap out the soot stains, scrub out my Sam Brown belt, and reapply polish to everything. But the following morning, when I arrived, I was ready for Sergeant Smack. At least I thought I was. After clapping eyes on me, Smack had me at attention, nitpicking loose threads and smears. As punishment, he set me to picking up cigarette butts and wind-blown trash from the courtyard. I felt like eyes were in every window, burning mockery into me as I chased scraps, and my cap threatened to fall off. But when I rose to do one more transfer of muck, I found only Inspector Tradfan. He was smoking, and as usual his eyes moved restlessly. I wasn't sure if he had been watching me specifically. His gaze met mine, though, as he went to knock out the dottle from his pipe, but he twisted his lip at me and went back inside, not adding more dirt as a low courtesy. Eventually I finished, and he was waiting. He pivoted me by the shoulders and guided me out of the door the way I had come. Apparently— 
He intended an early lunch, as I found us retracing our steps from the previous day. "'What will you have, Baraclough? he inquired affably, when the proprietress appeared. "'Mian Tiao,' I said, with furious attention to the intonation. Tredfan added a quick phrase, and held up two fingers. What emerged was something like Italian spaghetti, but at least it appeared to be identifiable meat— and by eating very, very slowly, I felt confident I wasn't splashing myself over much, enough to spare concentration to ask a question. "'What did you track down, sir?' Hm? he answered, his mouth full, and swallowed. "'Yesterday, sir. I just wondered where your two lads led you, in your chase. No need to rub it in, Baraclough. I lost them. Despairing, I immediately mourned the fact that I had irritated both my sergeant and my inspector in the same week. But Tredfan laughed heartily, and looked directly at me, with his piercing eyes. They made it to the edge of the concession, and off into the fields, probably. I suppose I could have fired, but— He waved a chopstick. Apart from your little adventure, it just seemed like a housebreaking or smashing grab, hardly worth shooting anyone over. And that was that, until we continued our saunter. I realized pretty quick that we were returning to the scene. At that age I had the political wits of a budgerigar, but even I got nervous. We'd been told to hand over the case to Special Branch, but you have to understand that it wasn't the done thing to question your commander. Even if it sounded like disobedience to higher orders— not the done thing in a domestic force, let alone a colonial posting, where these unspoken rules tend to be even more rigid. The side street itself was absent any more near do wells although we did pass a young European man who lifted his hat and greeted us with a cheery, "'Officers?' I noted his appearance, but since Tradfan continued, I let him be. Casting about like a bloodhound, Tredfan traced the marks of Chinese slippers. They led us around a couple of short corners into a U-shaped dead end. Brick walls on three sides hung with faded paint and paper notices. And the wall opposite us, like an accusing eye, was a broken sash window about five feet off the ground. Hmm, expressed Tredfan reticently. He squatted down and peered about. "'Tell me what you notice,' he asked. "'With my earlier warm-up cleaning the yard, "'I looked down first, paced a while and crouched. "'Then I sniffed at the slightly rancid smell. "'We're the first coppers to come through. "'Indeed, that would be surprising, "'given we handed off to Special Branch. "'That excellent body of men are renowned for thoroughness and tenacity. "'How do you draw your astonishing conclusion?' Tredfan remarked dryly. Police footwear leaves quite distinctive impressions, even in shallow dirt, and where they do not, they scrape cobbles with hobnails. But do our august colleagues in special branch not go plain clothes? He pushed. They do, sir, but they still tend to wear copper's boots or patent leather. Both leave a similar heel mark, compared with the slipper prints you can see here. Even if they had been here, sir— There would be other marks. We've not been here a minute, and you've already left traces in the dirt there, and dropped a cigarette. Tradfan paused in the middle of lighting his fresh gasper, and raised an eyebrow. If Special Branch had been here and looked over the scene, we'd see footprints, at least one cigarette, and probably tire track marks from an automobile. Very good, Constable, he said quietly, puffed heavily, and cocked an eyebrow at the window. He then withdrew a shilling piece and flipped it, catching it on the back of one hand and covering it with the other. Heads or tails? Heads, sir. He checked, grimaced, and walked up to below the window, bending a knee and cupping his hands. Come on, then, quickly and quietly. He grinned mischievously. Sir, I said, but resignedly put one foot as indicated and heaved myself up to take a look. In haste, I narrowly missed a wicked piece of glass that shivered, glinting in ambush. That's odd, sir, although Tredfan just grunted a reply. 
Glass looks like it was broken out from inside. I hopped down, and we quickly established that there was indeed a spray of shards in the alley, suggesting that either the break had come from inside, or the breaker had stood outside and pulled Glass away. My, my, Treadfan tutted. It seems we've come across evidence of a disturbance on our patrol. We had better have a look inside and ensure no one is in need of assistance. I rolled my eyes at this pantomime, but still said nothing to challenge him. With some grunting and use of my truncheon, I was able to clear the remains of the glass and haul myself through into the darkened room beyond. It was still, slightly musty, and echoed faintly. But no outraged matrons or knife-wielding ruffians charged. After explaining, Treadfan passed me a rather dim but welcome trench lamp. Using it, and allowing my eyes to adjust, I looked once, twice, and three times around. I leaned my head out. I think you will want to take a look at this, sir. When at length he joined me, Treadfan concurred with a whistle. Curiouser and curiouser. The room was bare-boarded. It seemed to be brick-walled and plastered in the European style. There was no fireplace, no furniture, no light or light switch, nor gas lights. More importantly, even after tapping the walls, we could find no door. The only point of ingress or egress was the window, which we quickly confirmed was broken from inside. There wasn't a single shard visible on the floor beneath. Only the most careful cracksman would have left nothing after pushing it in, and the debris outside indicated it had not been done carefully. Treadfan threw his cigarette out, and wafted the smoke away theatrically. Carefully, he then paced sonorously across the boards, and stood with his back and fingertips to the other wall. "'What else do you notice, constable?' I breathed in, then exhaled, defeated. "'I don't know, sir. No smell. Not a shred of local tobacco. Not soap, nor dog, nor even a bowl of cabbage. Have you come across a room in this town that hadn't any smell?' "'I suppose not, sir,' I said, although I wasn't sure he had a real point. "'If it's just an empty room, why would it have a smell?' Treadfan glared. "'I will grant you a room with no door is likely to be empty. But how does a room go empty in this city? If a mule falls down dead in the morning, someone will charge rent on its hind quarters before sundown.' I shrugged as deferentially as I could and we went out the way we came. Straightening our official costumes, we went door to door in a circuit, around and about. The neighboring establishments turned out to be, clockwise, a garment business, a lodging for tradesmen, a clockmaker's workshop, and a house of ill repute whose madame lamented our impertinence with the air of a duchess. None of the neighboring addresses had any indication that they possessed a hidden door or tunnel into the adjoining room. The garment works and clockmakers had bare brick, devoid of scars. The lodging and the madams had somewhat stained wallpaper that we were able to inspect after negotiation and delay. But these locations, too, betrayed no sign of hidden passages, or, for that matter, a scrubbing brush. Nevertheless, after being ejected from the brothel like deadbeat customers, we were met on the pavement by a surprise— a slightly dainty Cossack in pale grey tailored uniform, and an outsized sheepskin hat. He clicked his heels and extended a card to the inspector, which he read while I looked him over. Quite a few Russians had appeared in Shanghai these last years, and we had been warned on arrival about them. Some were white, but others like this one had the flat eyes and cheekbones of the Mongols. Those who did not style themselves royalty, and even some of those, were toughs from the Civil War, and made a living as muscle for hire. At the depot, we were warned that they were all drunks, armed, and had no respect for the law. Although, in fairness, that described almost everyone in the port, from coal magnates to bootnecks. This specimen was certainly a veteran, perhaps no older than me, but his years had passed harder than mine. I could see that he had met with some accident, 
where a quantity of flesh had been scooped out of his cheek and neck. I could not tell if it was by shot, by shell, or the surgeon's saving graces. His lively brown eyes met mine in a frank stare that left me feeling somehow ashamed. I looked away and coughed. "'Yes, thank you,' said Treadfan, returning the card. "'Please tell your master we will see him at the hour appointed.' The Cossack clicked his heels again, placed the card back in his pocket, tucked his scabbard in, and made away in a curious waddling stride. Treadfan gazed after him with wonder. "'Notice the gait. Cavalryman. Tartar, probably,' he said, in his schoolteacher voice. "'Well, at least we shook something loose. "'Sir, you and I will be joining Dr. Fang de Valenzuela,' said Treadfan, putting a Spanish accent on the surname, but a Chinese accent on the personal. "'Joining him for tea at the palace.' "'I blinked. "'The Palace Hotel,' Treadfan sighed. He did not look as if he relished the prospect, although it had an excellent reputation. In any event, let's cut along before more nabobs show up, threatening social intercourse. Pretty soon I realized we were en route to the barracks of the reserve unit. Clearly the inspector intended some range time. I bristled, and wondered if I'd ever lived down a reputation for being a poor shot. I agonized about this as young men will do all the way. On arrival, Treadfan returned the smart salute of a turbaned Sikh officer. Inside, we were placed in the hands of an instructor who treated us with the exquisitely measured politeness that NCOs reserve for the dangerously insane and for idle commissioned officers. A reasonable calming tone and short clear sentences that can be easily understood. We spent an hour or two as their guests, running through the full range of small arms in the newest drills of fire and movement. We heard men doing hand-to-hand training between the shots. Afterwards, we had just enough time to wash and brush up in the barracks, before taking rickshaw to the palace hotel. Chapter 3 On arrival, I was mildly surprised to see the young European from earlier disembarking by his own vehicle. But as I was in the business of holding the door for the inspector and fussing with my uniform cap, I had no opportunity to approach the man. He made his way to the bar as we entered the lounge, and gave no indication of recognizing us in turn. Oriental hotels, and particularly those in Shanghai— are quite accustomed to curious customers and costumes, but it was impossible to miss Dr. Fang and his bodyguards. Fang was resplendent in an emerald green single-breasted jacket, seated at a corner table with chairs open for us. His jack-booted guard stood, arms crossed, surveying the room with cold hostility. Fang did not stand, but did sweep an arm theatrically at the two chairs. I was taken aback by the rudeness to the inspector, and confused by being invited to sit, although I supposed having me stand facing those two roughs would have too closely resembled an armed standoff. So, we accepted the seats. I took the inspector's hat and marched off to deposit it with mine and my truncheon at the coat check. By the time I returned, the tea and opening observances had been made. I looked for milk, but seeing none, I sipped as quietly as possible, and opened my ears. The doctor spoke with a feminine musicality that bordered on soft singing. Fang was completing some long-winded discourse upon the lamentable climate in Shanghai, and how inferior it was to his native Manila. The birds and flowers, he said, were drab by comparison, and the nights cold. I noticed that in keeping with the remarks, his green coat seemed thickly padded, and he had a saffron-yellow silk scarf around his throat. His skin had a greyish pallor, like a fish's belly. Something here definitely did not suit his constitution. I would have suspected consumption, but he made no tell-tale coughs during the whole interview. "'Won't you enjoy a sandwich?' 
He waved languidly to the assortment on the stand. I took one that turned out to be very fine ham and mustard. The inspector wordlessly declined. It made up for the milkless, unsugared tea. Meanwhile, the inspector lit a cigarette, which made Dr. Fang frown. I gather you've been taking an interest in one of my properties, he lilted. Treadfan's response was merely to inhale and then squint through his exhaled smoke. We observed a broken window and were attempting to contact the owner of the property to alert them to the damage. Which property is yours? Treadfan asked, and reeled off some of the addresses. It is immaterial, Fang demurred. Since you found no theft, I presume this is no longer a police matter. Our inquiries are ongoing, Treadfan batted back. I swallowed some sandwich and snagged another. Sugared ham is a favorite of mine. How did you know there was no theft? When did your own men get there? Treadfan continued. I run a number of businesses, Fang replied airily. I was only recently made aware that there had been a disturbance. My man made inquiries. Nothing of value had gone. That struck me, though. I know now that I was picking up on the tiny twitch of the mouth that a bearded man sometimes has when lying. They presume that a beard conceals their expressions like a mask. It is one reason I never trust a man who has one. But in most men, especially those who affect a small, trimmed beard, the expressions can be clearly seen with a little practice. Fang— was apparently quite concerned that something of value had indeed gone. He moved to repost with that energy, like a pressed fighter. I understood that the matter of gang activity was the province of special branch, Fang sneered. I wondered if this silky creature had an informant at the station, or just knew our business like most Shanghai businessmen seem to, by gossip. Keeping the king's peace is the responsibility of all officers— we protect all business interests, even— Treadfan paused pointedly. I'm sorry. What did you say your business was, exactly? I'm in the business of import and export, Fang replied. At present? He waved a hand at his guards. I am working tirelessly to ensure that cultural artifacts from Russia are not desecrated by the Bolsheviks. You mean you are taking advantage of refugees? Treadfan said, quietly and clearly. But Fang simply giggled, amused. Hardly. Most honest refugees have lost their valuables long before reaching the settlement. I do business mainly with white Russian officers. When appropriate, I extend employment to their men. Their men are invariably abused and ill-paid. Yet they are quite loyal for the right money, and I assure you, entirely lethal." Treadfan raised an eyebrow over his cigarette. I mean only that I may be able to spare the official police the necessity of guarding my properties, Fang continued. During the rioting last year, the so-called nationalists, and here he made a fist with uncharacteristic physicality, broke into and looted many properties, but my men easily ensured that my own interests were unmolested. Indeed, well, we appreciate that, sir. The municipal authority does encourage the use of— And here Treadfan spoke up so that the guards could hear him. Night watchmen to protect industry. This was perfectly true, if pointed. But if the two Russians understood and took offence, it was not reflected in their faces. Exactly so, Inspector. But I am glad you were able to accept my invitation— I did so want to express my gratitude for the diligence of the force. At this, to our surprise, Fang gained his feet, with the aid of a Cossack who sprang forward solicitously. First the inspector, and then I also stood, unsure of the sudden move, but inspired by greater politeness than Fang had shown us. I am afraid that I am not well, the doctor confided with a grimace, tugging his neck-scarf tighter. But I insist that this not disrupt your evening. He waved at the white-coated waiter, and fired off some French. Your dinner will be my pleasure, please. 
He smiled wanly, and departed, flanked by his bodyguards. We waited, and finished the tea. "'Well, Barraclough,' puffed the inspector, "'what did you make of him?' "'I'm not quite used to Orientals,' I deflected. "'Nor fancy hotel suppers,' I deflected again, more successfully. Treadfan smiled ruefully. "'Yes, well, don't get too used to them. I happen to think you might be an honest man.' He wagged a finger at me sternly. "'And honest men don't get to take advantage of the hospitality of men like de Valenzuela, very often. But still,' he continued, and signalled to remove the tea-things, "'I think a good feed is in order, since we're in earnest pursuit of our inquiries. Why not let the criminal support His Majesty's police for a change?' Dinner at the palace sounded better than cold tinned pilchard and onion sandwiches in my lodgings. It would certainly give my next letter home a little swagger. So we settled in to while away the time for an hour or two, before the dining room opened in earnest. Treadfan was in his element, and to the manor born. He scoured the lounge and procured newspapers. I caught up with current affairs, which I felt then were supremely significant, and he laboured on the crosswords. We smoked his cigarettes and took coffee, which I was acquiring a taste for. Eventually, we were quietly informed by the waiter that the dining-room had opened, and we were shown to a table, albeit one in a far part of the room, behind some potted palms. Here, I assume, two uniformed officers would not upset the regular clientele. Treadfan confirmed we were dining at Fang's expense, and rattled off a sequence of dishes, which I awaited with some trepidation. Fortunately, I quickly realized that the hotel served European food, and was able to relax with actual metal knife, fork, and spoon. Treadfan made polite conversation, and inquired after home and my family. He bored of that pretty quickly, though, and began to quiz me on my training, which it seemed was to a wholly different, and to his mind superior quality, to his own introduction to the police. All the while we drank, first champagne, then wine, and I don't mind admitting I soon reddened to my ears like a retired colonel. The pleasant conviviality was abruptly interrupted, when the waiter showed a young man to our table, and seated him as if he were an expected guest. It was the young man we had seen twice earlier. Tradfan halted mid-anecdote and stared— but the interloper simply instructed the waiter to bring lobster mayonnaise and more champagne. Permit me to introduce myself. Lucifer Abaddon, 1D, the man said, helping himself to an open bottle, but using what was probably the wrong glass. We both stared at him, and he laughed heartily. He waved a cigarette like a music hall conjurer, and laughed again. "'I believe you have the wrong table,' said Treadfan, rather coldly. "'I don't think so,' said the newcomer, acknowledging the arrival of another bottle. "'You would be Inspector Nicholas Treadfan, and you Constable Mark Barraclough.' His accent was British public school, like Treadfan's, and boyishly excited. It seemed pointless to deny it, so I nodded. "'Just so.' and the individual on whose dollar we are dining goes by the name of Dr. Fang de Valenzuela. Although I will not shock you when I say that the actual Dr. de Valenzuela died of influenza in 1919. The name Fang is a fiction over the true horror of the man. He smiled ineptly and looked around for the waiter. Treadfan removed, cleaned, and replaced his glasses. I think, since you bring the subject up, that you had better introduce yourself by your real name, said Treadfan. Lucifer Abaddon is a pen name, unless I mistake you. The newcomer looked surprised, and pantomimed a bow using just his glass. Then he sat up straighter, looking more serious. Like uh, Dr. Fang, I find a nom de guerre, convenient fiction, especially when travelling abroad. Lucifer Abaddon commands better attention from hoteliers and officials than Rodney Llewellyn. 
apparently a fallen angel, is regarded as more miraculously impressive than a Welsh poet. Although, of course, in reality, the opposite is true. I tend to think of you more as a writer of detective novels, but perhaps that is a professional bias, replied Treadfan. Do you really? I say, that is too good of you, enthused Llewellyn. And here the conversation was interrupted by the appearance of the lobster and twinkling mayonnaise silver. Yes, he continued around rapid forkfuls. Really, detection is the thing. We are born, we observe the world around us, we deduce our reality, and we die. We are all thus detectives, although we are not all honoured to serve king and country. He pronounced these with audible capitalization. I was beginning to tire of his theatrics, and if he hadn't been a toff, I'd have hauled him up by his collar and shown him the gutter. So, are you here researching for a new story? Tradfan asked, sounding friendly but looking stonily serious. No, Inspector, I am here on a matter of quite serious endeavour. As my mentor G. K. would put it, I am here hunting anarchists. We have very few anarchists here, Mr. Llewellyn, interjected Tradfan. Nationalists, socialists, bootleggers, swindlers, slavers, opium runners, a few war profiteers. Anarchists, though— they're bad for business. Ah, you see, therein lies the rub. The poet wiped his hands clean, and straightened further, carefully and soberly moving his plates to the empty quarter of the table. Right now you're on the case, but the case is already refusing to obey the rules. The rules? I asked, despite myself. The poet nodded, like a kindly instructor, acknowledging an intelligent question. G.K. and Miss Sayers and some others of us, the so-called conscientious detectives, have been composing a set of rules. We may or may not formalize ourselves at some point soon. They set out the rules for an acceptable mystery. The reader must have all the clues, suggested Tredfan. Llewellyn laughed approvingly. Exactly so, Inspector. To be worthy of consideration, the reader must be given all the pieces before the completion of the story. Otherwise, where is the fair play? There are some other rules, of course, of which your current case is violating several. The villain appearing to be a Chinese is a lamentable stereotype which we would avoid. The people of China have a great spirit and culture that would better suit heroes than pantomime caricatures. But in any case, Dr. Fang is no more Chinese than my boot heel, sir, so we shall let it pass. Further, it has been agreed that the detectives must, of course, not receive any miraculous or accidental assistance, nor must any supernatural or esoteric force be accountable. Now, on this particular point, G.K. and I differ from our friends in our society. When a man takes up the cross and steps out to do battle against evil— is he not benefiting from the strength and courage of that conviction? Yet the conviction is as immaterial as that candle flame there. You cannot touch it, yet it can burn you. The light it sheds makes our world, yet you cannot stand upon light. The poet must have seen our expressions harden, and realized he was losing us. Forgive me. G. K. puts these things so much better than I— although he will concede I have the advantage over him when it comes to navigating a dock front at night, hobnobbing over rum and water, or tossing a mills bomb. We both looked at him silently and levelly, but he forged on. You're investigating the business of a room with no doors, a theft with no object, and a criminal who has committed no legislated crime. Yet you know something is wrong, very wrong. Well, I am here to ensure that you have all the pieces of the puzzle, whether you like those pieces or not. Fang is not an anarchist in the sense of some kindly old nonconformist who wishes to burn the city council for being cruel, or some dowager aunt overflowing with good ideas who wishes to wear trousers and smoke cigars on a pirate ship. <laughs> Fang is an anarchist in the true sense of the word. He rejects growth and order. 
He worships unlife and untruth. He wishes to abolish reason itself as a revolt against the universe. He will use any device and make any bargain if it can shatter the stars that set our destinies. He would crown a blowfly king if it upset one apple cut, although, as you will discover, he does far worse. His mentor, if you can call him that, is known as Nyarlathotep. An Egyptian? I asked, and received another condescending nod of encouragement. Only in the most superficial sense. Some call him the Black Pharaoh. Others associate him with the Devil. The Yorkshire witch, Alice Hewson, said that he appeared like a black man upon a black horse with cloven feet. She fell down and worshipped him on her knees. Although confidentially he is not a master in his own right, but serves a demiurge known only as Azathoth, the sultan of all demons. Nyarlathotep is believed to make bargains and accept sacrifices in exchange for knowledge, yet he divulges secrets only to cloud the truth, not reveal it. He destroys like the Indian goddess, but unlike Kali, he seeks to destroy for its own sake, not to create a new. Opium— and the dreams and distraction that it brings are a mere foretaste of his so-called enlightenment. So, we suspected he would have agents here in Shanghai, and, he finished primly, we were right. Now, I know that our misguided officials regard opium as a necessary evil in Oriental commerce, but I assure you that I am not here as some offshoot of the Salvation Army. I am in deadly earnest— if Fang is advancing the agenda of Nyarlathotep, then Fang must be stopped. The man's face was heated now, with wine or with passion. He held a clenched fist by his plate. Unlike Dr. Fang, this hand was flecked with scars and was corded with muscle. He looked directly into my eyes, with pleading instead of fury. I returned his gaze. Tredfan stood in his seat, and broke the spell. As you say, Mr. Llewellyn, I am a police detective, not a poet. I must solve the crime with the facts that I can place upon a page, or in a locked wooden box at Nanjing Road. I must bring those facts before a magistrate, and enforce due process of law. Indeed, said the poet, sadly and solemnly. You serve a higher power, the common man who wishes to see the sun rise to-morrow, on an orderly world, a world without bogeymen and dragons in the darkness, and you cannot play the game as we do in our society. However, so far as I am able, I do insist you heed my advice. If Fang and his associates break the rules, and you find yourself fighting like a philosopher, remember that it is your faith and hope that are your weapons. The gun may serve, but it cannot conquer— He trailed off cryptically. Oh, and one last thing, Inspector. Do you say grace before eating? Do you thank the Lord for your daily bread? Tredfan nodded, seriously. Then perhaps you should consider to whom you are saying grace, if you accept Dr. Fang's offer to pay for this meal. And so saying, he swept somewhat clumsily out of the dining room. He could soon be seen through the high windows hailing a rickshaw. Tredfan consumed two more cigarettes after this, and when the time came, he paid the tab himself. We parted company silently, although he acknowledged my salute as he left. Chapter 4 In the morning, we found a severed head. More accurately, a pair of working girls and their escort of Royal Marines found the head, just before dawn. They were in the vicinity of Pingliang Market. The Marines evidently thought this was a local matter and wanted to move on, but the finer feelings of the working women prevailed. A constable was summoned, a Chinese inspector was called shortly thereafter, and since we were officially at a loose end, we were dispatched to begin the investigation. The street in daylight was a busy thoroughfare, and four Chinese constables were struggling to keep it clear 
in the face of a whole collection of shouting Europeans, impatient Chinese, and honking cars. Vehicles were beginning to back up and snarl the surrounding streets. Under telephoned instructions, the scene had been left mostly undisturbed and covered with a waxed tarpaulin. Residents peered out of windows above us, swapping opinions at considerable volume in at least three languages. Tradfan irritably waved me to retake the statements of the Marines while he conferred with the inspector on the scene. A few minutes later, we pulled back the tarpaulin and crouched over that sorry article. If you have not had the opportunity to regard a severed head, I do not recommend it. A human being is made of such parts. We see heads every day in their ordinary attitudes. We may even form attachments to the heads of friends and family. We put the heads of kings on coins. We listen to them, adorn them, cradle and kiss their faces. A severed head, by contrast, is an obscenity. It has no right to exist. Nothing about it is correct. The eyes do not see, the lips do not speak, no thoughts spark in the brain. It is not even a piece of meat fit for the butcher. It is simply wrong. My reaction, therefore, was both logical and shameful. When I had recovered, I wiped my mouth and returned slightly unsteadily to the inspector. He was very gently moving the head, with the assistance of a Chinese officer, into a wooden box. He gave me a thoughtful look, and sighed with sincere regret. You had better get used to this, if you're going to work investigations. Come here, look at me. This head belonged to a lady. She was alive less than twenty-four hours ago, and unless we do our job, she will receive no justice. Do you want to see she gets justice? I nodded, of course. My uniform felt cold and stiff. My cap felt tight and slightly wet on my brow. We must, like Kipling, tell her story. We will depend on six honest men. What, why, when, how and where and who. I took a deep breath, straightened my back and looked around. Well, I said, betraying deep intelligence, no one reports seeing or hearing the murder. Not in itself unusual, constable. Look down. Feeling like a dunce, I lowered my eyes to the gutter. Dust, grit, a tide line of squashed cigarettes, even the beggars couldn't salvage. No blood, sir. Meaning the murder did not happen here. Cutting a lady's head off must throw some blood around, I expect. I expect so, too. Anything else? I don't know if it's a why as to the murder, sir. But if she was killed somewhere else, why bring the head here? Someone was guaranteed to find it. Tradfan thumbed his lapel, then began loading his pipe. Maybe they dropped it, carrying it somewhere else, I speculated. You mean they were driving along with the head balanced on a tray and it fell off as they rounded a corner, without them noticing? The inspector posited dryly. I think we can rule out an accident. It was found as is, not in a bag, which I would think even the least fastidious killer would employ. I don't understand at all, sir. I tried to think of parallels. The torso murders in London were about concealing the victim's identity, weren't they? Leaving a head is the exact opposite. I think we must look deeper, Barraclough. If the killer were practical, then we have the great river on our doorstep. Corpses are, sadly, barely remarked when they go to the sea. This must serve some other purpose than mere disposal. Maybe mocking the police? He bit the stem of his pipe, but did not light it. It seemed a bit of a stretched point to me at the time. I did not realize then how maniacs are not a breed apart, but are found in every walk of life. Nor did I understand how important it is to read their deeper motivations. It does seem like they were trying to make a point of some kind. I lied supportively. I thought further and took a deep breath. How exactly was she killed, then? Tradfan gestured invitingly to the box that the Chinese was holding. I blanched, but approached. You can use your hands, constable. She won't bite. Gingerly, I opened the box and rotated the object. The neck was pale, puckered, 
almost dry. It was very lightly dusted with debris from the street. I'm no expert, sir, but this looks like it was removed by something other than a sword or axe. Lots of small cuts, maybe. Not like a butcher's blade. My stomach tightened as I thought it through. So we may assume that the killer wasn't planning to do the job. Not done efficiently? Or perhaps they enjoyed doing it. Took their time, Tredfan observed with disgust. I sniffed, then sniffed more deeply. No smell, sir. No formaldehyde or vinegar. So like you said, it must be recent, but dried, drained out, and done some distance away and dropped here. I turned the head the other way. I looked closer. Grit and some glass stuck in the scalp, quite deep, I observed. But again, no blood. Constable? I addressed the Chinese officer holding the box. Did we ask and check the upper floors in these buildings? No. Only witnesses in the street-level rooms. Anyone who would hear or see. The Chinese replied calmly. So not up there? I indicated the roof-line, where there was a garret window. The Chinese shook his head dismissively. As we went upstairs to the room I'd indicated, I explained my theory that the head had fallen some distance to have debris embedded in it. Tradfan seemed willing to indulge the theory, mainly because hurling heads made the incident even more bizarre. We found little, a bare garret with rat droppings on the floor, and a small dusty window. The window could be opened after some effort, and there were some small indications that it had been manipulated recently. Gloved trails in the dust. No other signs or clues presented themselves, except for the minor detail that the door had been nailed shut and wallpapered over some years ago. Again, this was a room with no entrance, just a window. You notice that, constable? the inspector asked. No smell, sir. Not musty or damp. No blood. Nothing. We made our way back downstairs to the street and made further inquiries of the usual sort. The building, it seemed, was owned by the hunch-shouldered lady on the ground floor, who served us black tea with sugar. She who lived a liminal existence on the rent from her lodgers and her husband's pension. Unsurprisingly, she denied knowing about the existence of the room. Also, because we spared her any gruesome details of the case, she only seemed interested to have one more room to let. Nor, it seemed, had she or any other resident noticed anyone coming or going in the night, or disturbances on the roof. The inspector did his best to charm her, and after passing remarks on her decor, her husband's photograph and the virtues of constancy, safety, and dependability, she was induced to show us one of the pension checks. Sure enough, it was drawn on the Imperial Chartered Bank of Hong Kong, but the account was not the Green Funnel Line of London, but a Chinese-named company, a detail she seemed disinterested in. Back then to the street, and after pushing through the crowds, to the municipal records buildings. No hope of getting bank records, but we did look for any reference to the sender's name. A long, fruitless search through card indexes and boxes of paper. Stopping and stepping out for tea and a bun, we sat in silence, chewing, and trying to not think of a cold, dead face in a box at the coroner's office. I coughed. Inspector, sir, I wonder if the lack of records means anything. Shouldn't we have found something? Anything? Not really, constable. Records aren't held here like in London. Even if someone does bother to write something down, it can be misfiled, misplaced, lost to damp, lost to fire, or simply thrown out to make more space. Yes, but if there's one thing we do keep, it is shipping records and indemnities. I've seen hundreds. If that account was legitimate, surely we'd have found it somewhere in a court record or insurance claim. Tradfan conceded. Very well. I have dinner scheduled. But can I ask you to get telegraphs off to Lloyd's in London and to New York and Boston to see if they have anything? I sighed on the inside, but nodded dutifully. Good man, the inspector said, and left me to it.
Chapter 5 Suffice to say, the following week was the usual drudgery. Checking records, writing reports, waiting on dim and distant offices to reply. Sergeant Smack took every opportunity to give me work fatigues, and put me on physical jerks. Frustrating and humiliating, but not actually boring. Shanghai does not permit boredom. Checking my notebooks, I see that week we had fourteen reported thefts, five gang fights, at least one kidnapping resolved, and two other murders. One of an American businessman that was quickly traced to his wife. The second was of a French woman that seemed to be a robbery gone awry. Two Sikh constables were badly injured intervening in a fight between Dutch and Royal Marines, but I see no result in my notes. The investigation probably stuttered out when the respective navies closed ranks. Regarding our murder, all our cables did was confirm our suspicion that some sort of game was afoot with the property. There had been a suspicious effort made to muddy the trace of ownership for such an inconsequential address. The deeds themselves had vanished, but it did eventually pop up as collateral for loans on a half-dozen financial instruments. We briefly looked for some underground smuggling tunnels, but a great deal of the settlement is on a sort of soft sediment called alluvium. Even putting in sewerage is problematic, as the regular history of cholera and enteric fever will attest. Tunnels were out. The inspector mused over our results. If we can't join the address to anything else, then what is the point of it? And if there's no point besides it being an asset, why go to the trouble of concealing it? Inspector, I asked tentatively, we do know another odd property with a locked room in it. Tradfan looked over his glasses with calm reproach. I'm not an idiot, Constable. The case that dare not speak its name. Smoke coiled around us as we sat in a scratchy silence. The not doctor, he continued cryptically. Bored, I looked over the documents for the one hundredth time. I cleared my throat. Is it a crime to not report damage to an insured property? Civil case, he replied in gloomy reflection. Why do you ask? Only that there is the one report here of damage to a mystery property, a warehouse last year and I couldn't find a claim. The whole street was shot up and caught fire. How did it get on the table? It came back from Lloyd's because they group flood risk reports, and it was on the line below the first building. I looked embarrassed. To be honest, sir, I looked at it by accident, but it's got a similar tangle of ownership. Hmm, well, fortune favours and so forth, said Treadfan, but he was smiling ruefully. Address seems to be just the other side of your lodgings, I think. He checked the ticking clock. Let's head over that way. Nose around. If there's nothing doing, we can let you go a bit early. I've been keeping you outside regular hours already. That's all right, sir. Oh, he added, fetching his own equipment. Check your ammunition. Better to have it and not need it and all that. So we left the station and walked east, away from the setting sun. We walked in dignified silence, only interrupted by the necessity of stepping out of the way of pretty girls and the occasional toff under full steam. The building itself was only noticeable with the benefit of a suspicious eye. It was surrounded by warehouses and building work, domestic homes and incurious loafers. Yet it was also notably older by far. The street did indeed seem to have been affected by fire during 1927, yet this one structure seemed to have been untouched. Detectives, even at that time, were permitted to work in plain clothes, but we had not had an opportunity to change. So we used the shadows of a side street, and Tradfan made me take off my cap and crossbelt, and copy his body language. He rolled his shoulders over like a wet crow and turned his back one quarter to anyone in the unlighted windows. Cupping his hands round his cigarette, he lost the air of command completely. I'm confident that at one hundred yards we looked like colonial scurf contemplating a sheer disgrace, 
or chances waiting cheaply for a third party, a common enough sight in Shanghai. Nevertheless, we were lucky that when a suspect appeared, it coincided with a private row between two Chinese. I could not follow the blistering exchange, but you do not have to be a professor of languages to recognize the universal signs of one man offering to black the eye of another. So it was that when the Cossack appeared hurrying along, we were screened by the combatants. Indeed, we would have missed him ourselves, had he not been wearing his distinctive high hat. He was leading a working girl roughly by the hand as he went, and she pit-pattering gamely along behind. As soon as they appeared, they disappeared into the yard of the warehouse, squeezing through a partially open gate. We scuttled after them. Then, with no choice, we followed along around the corner, and were struck yet again with a dead end. The yard was small, and had no exits, not even a broken window. There, whispered Treadfan, and inclined his head. A wooden-sided coal bunker was in one corner. We approached it slowly, and with laughable stealth, as one would sneak up on a sleeping tomcat. It turned out to be a perfectly ordinary coal bunker, timber-sided, Enterprising souls had already taken advantage of the unlocked gate to empty it of all but the smallest fragments. We looked at the filthy interior, and our uniforms, and Treadfan grimaced. Heads or tails? I lost the toss on the square. The bin looked no cleaner from the inside. I don't see anything, sir. He's not— And like a light going out, I was gone. I say like a light, but the feeling was not only that of being plunged into darkness, but of having the universe entirely taken away, more like losing one's breath after a punch to the gut. I tried blinking, which of course did nothing. Did I think a piece of grit had done this? A canvas tent over me could not have robbed me so utterly. No tread fan, no coal bunker, no sky, nothing. Gone. I tried to speak, but heard nothing. I tried to move, but felt nothing. I wanted to touch my nose, but could not seem to reach, although I did not feel anything binding me. I briefly considered the possibility that I had died, but even as I did so, my senses began to overfill somehow. There was nothing, but nothing is impossible, and of course you cannot see the impossible. Likewise, a tinny screeching in my searching ears was overcome by a growling, pulsing sound, like an incoming tide. I felt like I was drowning in sound. My sight began to also play tricks on me. Light in green waves came over, red pulses, blue flitting shards like a breaking window. A yellow polyhedron orbited me in mad spirals, I lost all track of what was up, down, or sideways. I was becoming dizzy. The sinking feeling was bad, but not nearly so bad as the feeling once I was submerged in that sea of empty nonsense. With nothing outside my head but noise and light, time lost all meaning. I could have been caught like that for ten minutes. I could have been caught for a year. I do not want to record what passed through my mind. I'm not sure my state of mind can be described in words. By contrast, being suddenly hit in the face by a brick wall was a blessed relief. As the salt blood ran down my face, I realized I was giving throat to a continuous, thin shriek. So I stopped. My first groggy sensation was of empty air, although after the tangible nothing of the other place— even the stiff cold felt effervescent as champagne. A flat rooftop of utilitarian design. I was instantly sure I was high above Shanghai, although the darkened skyline seemed unfamiliar and gorgeously jeweled with many lights. An aeroplane, larger than any I'd ever seen before, sailed noisily overhead with a roar. I had no time to puzzle through my surroundings, however— as I was prodded rudely but not painfully in the side. 
A sour-faced Chinese, accustomed to hard living, had jabbed me with his crutch in a wordless challenge. Abashed, I realized I had no more right to be on this roof than he probably had, and instinctively apologized. My apology mollified him slightly, and he began to circle me with an active limp, leaning on his metal stick. The feeling of being inspected did nothing for my patience, however— and when he leaned in to give me a sniff through his scraggly whiskers, I backed off carefully out of reach. My care was warranted, because I nearly stumbled over a skylight of darkened glass. The man muttered something in Chinese, and sipped from a flask of steaming liquid. I felt some proof of authority would help, so I drew out my identification papers. These he examined minutely from beyond arm's length, squinting out of one good eye. Then he dismissed them with a shrug, and asked me another indecipherable question. I had little patience for his cross-examination, and began casting around for evidence of how I came to be on the roof, or a point of egress. None presented themselves, so in the absence of other options I turned back to my sole companion— who had sat upon a low wall, his legs stiffly out in front of him. There then followed a frank exchange of charades, familiar the world over, wherever an Englishman treads his ignorance. I made him understand that I had in fact no idea where I had come from, and he opined that I had fallen out of the sky, gesturing upward, a point I could hardly contend. I then made an ill-advised attempt to explain what a policeman was— and that I was pursuing a villain. My creeping across the roof in the attitude of a hunched monster only succeeded in making him laugh. He offered me a drink from his old-fashioned calabash. Out of an excess of politeness, feeling the cold wind, and hoping the gesture would preface him showing some safe way down, I took a swig. In my happy heart I was determined to show my appreciation." but the drink was some concoction of Chinese wine and herbs, simultaneously as acrid as lemon drops, and smoky as a campfire. Our eyes locked. I swallowed, and emitted a slight cough. Then that cough allowed some camphorated portion into my lungs, and I began coughing fit to burst. The old man merely hauled himself up, and nodded with satisfaction. Apparently, He deemed the medicine was doing me good, and began thumping my back as if to dislodge a plum pit from my windpipe. I spluttered and vomited again. Finally, I caught my breath and looked him in the one good eye. "'Thank you,' I said hoarsely. Again, he nodded and wrinkled his beard. Then, with the air of a stevedore pitching a sack, he shoved me staggering over the side of the building and into thin air. I had just enough time to feel outraged at his treachery, when I was hit in the back with a floor, boxing my brains for a third time. However, instead of a Shanghai street, I found myself staring up at a high nicotine-stained ceiling. There was a mildly indignant noise, and I became aware that I was being peered at by a face that was animated by a spirit of bureaucratic disapproval. By degrees I realized it was the upside-down visage of the special branch man, Courant. Constable, he said finally, and I hold myself once more to my full height over him, as he sat. I collapsed in the vacant office chair opposite him. On his side he had a pot of tea, a stubby service revolver, a handful of bullets, a set of tools, and a magnifying lens. Courant's general attitude was not that of a man astounded by the materialization of an injured policeman. It was more that of a man surprised by a rat in his bathroom. The revolver seemed somehow a part of our conversation. "'May I ask,' he said at last, "'how you come to be here?' On this point I felt quite strong. "'No idea, sergeant,' I replied in near-perfect honesty. At this the man hemmed and began tidying up his desk in a way that left him holding the revolver in a slightly absent way, like a carpenter clutching his ticket on an omnibus. "'Will Inspector Treadfan be joining us?' "'I don't know, Sergeant. 
He hemmed again, and his breathing settled into long, slow breaths. My short time in Shanghai had already taught me that these are the best indicator that a man is considering murder. My own pistol was on me, and loaded, but securely fastened in its holster a million lifetimes further away than the weapon lazily tracking me. I wondered if the inspector was indeed hot on my heels, and if I could use his arrival to make some sort of move. Then Corant spoke again. His voice carried the unmistakable air of command bestowed by birth and belied by his official rank. I take it that you two have been pursuing lines of inquiry in connection to the gang attack. I thought fast. We were pursuing a suspicious individual, I ventured, into my office, in the middle of the night, on the locked floor of a secret address. I coughed lamely. Corant sighed. I don't suppose I can persuade you to give up the chase for king and country? For the empire? Somewhat needled after a trying evening, I frowned angrily. I'd rather have this conversation with your officer, but in his absence I will try to explain, he continued with icy condescension. I presume you're investigating what you consider to be a simple case of theft or murder, but you're into the proximity of a prickly business, and you keep catching yourselves upon the thorns. Courant tried to look sympathetic, an expression that seemed as alien to him as humility. We looked at one another, I dishevelled and wild, he loose and armed. Then, when I failed to take his rather cryptic point, he continued. He had the air of a schoolboy swat, a know-it-all, that revealed he wasn't much older than I— he replaced his gun on the desk, and waved a sheaf of papers. "'You weren't here for the business last year, and neither was I. But I have here just some of the reports. Fighting in the streets, public executions, at least one thousand dead, or thereabouts. So many that a head here or there isn't counted. A bad business, wouldn't you say?' I nodded. It seemed the thing to do. "'Well, such is the business of government.' General Kai Shek felt it necessary to cut off a thousand heads because he feared that one thousand would lead a million astray. And being a man of moral courage, not to mention basic mathematics, he preferred to chop one thousand today than one million tomorrow. Under other circumstances, I might have taken issue. I used to in the schoolroom. I might have taken a different path but I had noticed that the corner I had originally fallen in was wobbling and shifting slightly, as if it had been drinking. I could just make out signs or symbols scratched into the dark wood. The rippling patch was no more than six feet from me. As it was, I just said, the police have to investigate murder. The incident in Ping Liang? He almost looked puzzled at the triviality, and rifled a stack of reports. A woman, wasn't it? then peered at me in fascination. It was as if I had confessed an interest in collecting painted parasols. I am telling you that your very presence here in my office demonstrates and confirms that you are involved in a special branch matter. Our business at present is to develop methods of intelligence that can grant us a nearly perfect understanding of the Chinese underworld and post-revolutionary Russia, so that another great war can be avoided. That is a very big pile of heads I wish to avoid, and people with that information by definition move in circles of blood. Who is your suspect? I hesitated, partly out of loyalty to the inspector, and partly out of bull-headed dislike for his tone. Constable, do I need to explain how fast or how simply I can terminate your career and have you sent home in disgrace? Answer my question— he barked stentoriously. I leaned forward, as if to take him into my confidence, and continued the movement into a dive that I hoped would do more than break my nose. Without hearing his outraged cries behind me, I plunged through the floor and into the empty space beyond. It was different this time. It was not different as changing one's shirt is different— it was more akin to stepping over one's accustomed doorstep, and realizing suddenly that your house is in fact, and always has been, on a precipice. 
a change in perspective. I still felt nothing when I became nothing. My skin still rang like a bell as before. I screamed and laughed as if I were bailing water from my drowning mind. However, amid the chaos a thought occurred to me. I realized that if this other place flowed between points in our world, then not only might I be lost forever on the current, worse, other things must travel in it as well. Where there are policemen, there are criminals. The question of what a criminal here might be seized me, and momentarily gave me a second's clarity. Then, as if in answer, a foulness seeped through the nothing, and there was a sound I at first mistook for a distant whistle. But that darkness became suffused with points of light, and the whistle became a cacophonous piping. I peered at the lights and listened, wondering if I might learn some important insight. Gradually, it became clearer, as one's eyes adjust to looking from a brightly lit study through a dark window. The lights were stars, the stars were eyes, and the stars were dying. The stars died slow, how slowly! Yet as they died, the star things made a piping and drumming sound. The sound was awful yet, hypnotic. It made me want to claw at my own face, and at the same time thirst to hear it more clearly. The thing that stopped me spiralling out of control cannot be described as good luck. I did not even see the thing, because that itself would surely have driven me mad. I saw a shadow move across the stars, and they themselves quailed in the night, a fitful movement of a sleeper rolling in their pit. It was not vast, although the scale of my vision was cosmic. It was beyond relative size, as if I had glimpsed the whole universe in the corner of my eye. It was a reflection of the core of myself, this world, of God himself, beyond God. I cannot possibly describe my terror and revulsion, for in that moment I believe I saw the centre of everything, a centre that was not the benevolent God of Abraham, or the vengeful God of Gomorrah, but one of perfect indifference to its creation, for whom merely waking would erase all existence in a blink, to be replaced with a single unity, a unification like the blast of a grenade. Waking that entity would destroy the gods and the stars themselves. It would make creation and destruction themselves meaningless. Can I say how I ran in a space that was not space? I ran with my every thought and desire from that cribbed ossuary and its inhabitant. And so madly did I run, that I think my fear alone propelled me back to the material for the last time. Chapter 6 Suffice to say that when I found myself back in reality, I sagged with relief. Somehow I knew it was Shanghai, although the warehouse I was in could, in principle, have been almost anywhere. Crumbling brick walls, nearly empty, dusty-windowed, bare-boarded. I wept for some time and grieved for my ignorance, until I despaired of forgetting— "'Is anyone there?' I called. Then I remembered to unholster my colt. I found the trench lamp clipped to my Sam Brown next to it, but on reflection elected to shut up and use a little stealth this time. I heard a strange cry, high-pitched and abbreviated as a rat's but louder, from the next chamber, echoing faintly. I paced forward, my gun held to the centre of my body, light on my feet— my training coming back to me this time. A figure scuttled through the shadows, head down, rear in the air, like a man pantomiming a kicked dog. Then a second ran right past me. Its appearance in the dim light was hideous. A mask of loose skin, something like a sick pig or scaby dog. Long-nailed feet. The figure dashed into a shadowed corner not big enough to accept it, and disappeared entirely. The strange fleeing things did not seem to be focused on me, though, and I was beyond recoiling at the mealy grotesque. However, a second sound announced a more tangible threat, 
Steps approaching. Boots, definitely. Not Chinese slippers. In that instant it dawned on me that they were military boots and well-maintained. A short, snappy crunch, not a rolling sound, solid and hard. Forewarned, when the figure came around the corner I was in shadow. I don't know if I missed because of nerves, or he heard me, but three shots hit nothing but air. I loosed two more rounds. The man was moving oddly, whipping about like a sapling in a gale. He had none of the grace of dancing, but at the same time lacked the desperation of dodging. He tumbled and span on the legs like springs. My magazine emptied, and as if in response he bounded forward, saber flashing. In the instant, my training took over, and rather than withdraw, I leapt forward as well. I later found out he had shaved a lump out of my ribs, leaving a permanent nick in the bone. But adrenaline and rage are a wonderful thing. In close, my weight and height had the advantage of him. We clinched in a bear hug, and I raked my hobnails along his jack-booted shin, which did little. However, I continued down and drove into the arch of his foot, which must have hurt like hell. Unfortunately for me, he responded by bringing his knee up hard into my trousers, which made me see stars and loosen my grip. There followed a tangled dance, where we slammed into some walls. We were beyond civilized niceties. I found my head next to his, and he seized the opportunity to bite my left ear. However, familiar with amateur rugby, the pain in my head merely galvanized my spirits. So, I used my strength awkwardly to hop in the air with both feet and frog-jumped forward to come down atop of him with a crunch. Once, twice, I slammed my head into his face, and thereby his head met the hard floor. Three... Four times I mashed his nose to pulp. Then, roaring defiance, I got to my knees and punched him until he lolled like a broken doll. I lit my electric lantern and surveyed the scene. It was the Cossack I had met earlier, one of Dr. Fang's bodyguards. He seemed small in his uniform and very young. Again, I marveled at his old injuries. Tough young lad, but he wasn't getting up again. I stood, wobbly with adrenaline and pain, and made for the stairs. All the way down to the entrance I expected to run into another guard, but none appeared, nor did I hear any more squeaking from those crawling things. I reloaded from my scarce supply. Opposite the entrance was a glassed-in office. In the office I could see the other Cossack guard stripped to his shirt-sleeves, he was working someone over slowly and professionally. Questions were being asked between the blows. I'm not proud of it, but I could see this brute was on a par with me for size. Already bruised and tired, I shot him in the head without warning. His fall revealed Inspector Treadfan. Treadfan looked in a bad way, but his breathing was steady. I think he said, Get Fang. Then he gestured with his chin towards a staircase going down. The door had several flash-looking locks, but was lolling open. Descending, the basement was only partly what I expected. For starters, it had a poet in it. I saw him sneaking in from a side office, holding a broom-handle mauser. He was heading towards the same flickering firelight I was, and carrying a large wooden container. "'Constable Barraclough,' said Llewellyn, eyes hunting ahead. "'How did you know it was me?' I asked from the shadows. "'You've been the talk of the town. Even in Shanghai, when a police officer vanishes into thin air for three weeks, it excites comment. Your inspector dug up four tons of soil looking for a trapdoor. But—and here he looked over with a conspiratorial grin. "'More importantly, how could it be anyone else?' The narrative demands it. Step this way. We may not have long. You can tell a lot about a man by how he eats. The man calling himself Dr. Fang de Valenzuela ate seated on his naked haunches in a room heaped with gleaming artifacts. He ate in a monotonous fashion, but without method. Sloppy gulps interspersed with gnawing and tearing. 
He ate with great hunger, but no relish. He ate like an animal, although no animal ever ate so lifelessly or so steadily, not even a cow at pasture. Held in both his hands was a woman's body, being slowly devoured. He had her calf in his mouth, the foot entirely gone, the remains of her stockings disregarded as he chewed. And like an animal, a pet, Fang had an owner. One elegant hand rested proudly atop his head. It had the shape of a man, and wore a suit in a late Victorian cut, but with no shirt. Not black of race, but his exposed skin was the deep purple-black of a bruise, sick and swelling, every inch, tall, with the erect bearing of a crowned king. Infernus ululens mulia praedira sub umbras, to try it altavago especolo, nec carmina victa, whispered Llewellyn to himself. I am an officer of the Shanghai police, I stated, coming out of the darkness into the circle. Put the woman down. Fang did not stop chewing, and the black man did nothing but look up and direct a smile at me. It was just a smile, but it made me stagger. I could feel that smile leafing through the pages of my memory, stroking my realization of the chaotic center of creation. I felt violated by the intimacy. I could tell that figure felt awed and exultant at my earlier vision, but also frightened in a way beyond the capacity of any mere human. The knowledge that this thing had power over me, but could itself feel fear, was energizing. I bared my teeth and forced myself closer step by step. I pushed on, like a man dragging himself up the hull of a sinking ship. The figure in black was not even amused by my defiance, but it did relinquish its grasp of Dr. Fang's head, with the detachment of dropping a paper bag. It became hard to see, just the shadow of a figure. Then it was gone. I could not fathom how it left, any more than why it had been there in the first place. I gasped with released tension. I realized I was covered in a cold and slimy sweat. So too was Llewellyn, who struggled up beside me. We both advanced on Fang, who had continued uninterrupted. It was apparent that he had consumed many victims in this position. This whole end of the basement was stained in old blood— Broken jewellery and the odd button were mired in ichor, alongside clumps of hair and fragments of bone. There are some indecencies too terrible to look upon. Not all are on a cosmic scale. My eyes filled with tears that poured down my cheeks. I sobbed, not as a child, but the hacking ugly sobs of a grown man in full health. I sobbed until Llewellyn shook himself into focus. Come on now, he said quietly, and with sympathy. We can mourn later. He's likely only vulnerable when he is eating. Warily, and with his quiet directions, we extracted what looked like small pillows from the wooden crate, stamped in Chinese. With equal care and revulsion, we packed these around Fang's greasy body, trying not to touch him directly or disturb his revolting meal. As we did so, I realized that what I at first took to be boils were smooth, leech-like things, white as porcelain and fat as blisters. He seemed infested, as around them his skin was flaking and bloodshot. Each time he gulped down a mouthful, they pulsed in answering rhythm. Llewellyn shot me another sympathetic glance as he took out two metallic pencil-shaped objects. There is a place that men may go in dreams. Our greatest champions and our greatest enemies go there. There one may find wisdom and insight, as well as adventure. But it is safe for no man. These, for example, are a parasite native to their rivers. I will concede that they allow a man to preserve his flesh in seeming immortality. It is also said that their venom— allows a man to achieve a communion with Nyalathotep, and in so doing to rip secrets from beyond sight or sound, power physical and political. 
The poet pulled a coiled wire from one pencil object. He then gripped the other end and, straining, crushed it between thumb and finger. There was an audible snapping sound. He gently slid it into the end of one of the bags. Whether Fang contracted this parasite on purpose, or if they came to him in one of these looted artifacts, I do not know. But in common with most bullies, he failed to do his homework. For if he had, then he would know that the parasites have a great, insatiable hunger. They preserve the flesh, but consume the vitality of the host. So the immortal man is driven, like the ghoul, to eat his fellow man. He must do so regularly— and in quantity. Hence, he finished, placing the second pencil, and gestured sadly at our surroundings. I doubt Fang is worth a single one of the victims he has eaten. But, he continued ferociously, in about eight minutes, I intend to see whether immortality is distinct from invulnerability. I propose answering the question with a scientific and poetic application of sixteen pounds of General Zong Chang's best Amatol explosive. On our rather hurried way out, we collected Inspector Treadfan, and stumbled on our last legs into the oddly deserted Suchow Road. A car was approaching, and we shambled quickly towards it like three mates on shore leave. However, I was not at all relieved to have iron grips put on me by the occupants of the first car. A second car drew up. Sergeant Courant disembarked, smoking a cigar, and peered disapprovingly at our wretched appearance. It seemed that he had intended to prevent us approaching his informant, Dr. Fang. It was therefore especially gratifying to hear the charges go up. There was a colossal bang that shook our hearts in our chests. The special branch officers, Courant included, had the gaping mouths of beached fish. Then their realization dawned, and with it, anger. For our part, Treadfan first, then Llewellyn, and finally even I started laughing. We roared with defiant mirth. The blast had been a joyful sound to us, a rude denial of secrets and darkness in man-made thunder. It was followed by the noise of the building collapsing into the street and into the river. Rubble and dust fell all over us. One plain-clothes man with a cut on his head tried to restore order by placing us roughly under arrest. Then, to our surprise, Courant interrupted and gestured him mildly away. No need, no need, let them go. Take them to the infirmary. In fact, he continued with avuncular approval, we shall see that they receive medals for thwarting a group of murderous dynamiters. It will read very well in the newspapers. Quite right. Then Corant's face turned shadowed once more. Fang was useful, no doubt. He gave us a pitying smile. But after all, there are always more where he came from. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.